Good afternoon everyone, um, my name's Kate and I'm a Business Development Manager in the CPD Unit at Cardiff University. I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you to this session today and, and thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, just to reiterate that we're going to take some questions towards the end of the session, um, but feel free to use the Q&A facility um, as you're going through uh, today um, if you're thinking of any questions and, and want to ask Richard at the end. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you uh, to Richard, Richard Rose, um, who will be taking today's session. So thank you, Richard. Richard, you're still on mute. I apologise for that. Flat fingers and all that sort of stuff. Um, thank you very much, Kate, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, or I should say good afternoon, everybody now. Um, yeah, I'm Richard Rose, and hopefully uh, I'm going to give you a, a, a little taster for uh, what leading people through change is all about and uh, you know why it's probably even more important now than it has been uh, over the last uh, decade or so. Um, so here's the question. Why do people resist change? What is it that makes people anti-change? What is it that makes them feel uncomfortable about change? And uh, what is it that makes them think uh, that's not for me? And generally speaking, it's all about fear or anxiety of some sort. And when we talk about fear or anxiety, 
it comes from a whole bunch of different areas and across the whole uh, of the organization as well. It's not just the individuals, but it's also the hierarchy of management. And the first bullet there suggests that uh, maybe managers, whilst trying to implement change, may feel a loss of control. As well as the members of staff that are trying to lead through change may be feeling a loss of control of their own environment and their own job role. Maybe their job role isn't actually going to be there in the future. And what is their job role? Maybe that they feel that they don't have any input to the future, that the change is actually being done to them rather than them participating in a change. And therefore, yes, they feel powerless. It, you know, they're being steamrolled, rollered, if you like. Possibly, and I think this is probably a fairly uh, consistent view that I've certainly had over my years, that people feel um, that they have had a poor execution of change in the past. And therefore, why on earth should this be any different? And yet another you know, mess we're going to have to clear up for the bosses after it's all over. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, I hear a lot of is about poor communication of the change itself, of the plan, lateness of communication. And one of the things when I come to round up this session uh, that I will come back to is uh, you need to talk to people about change, no matter how much information you have at that time, whatever you have, you tell people. The fact that you might not have a detailed plan at that point is irrelevant. It's the fact that you are starting to communicate and starting to get people to think along those lines. Because fear of the unknown is a huge contributor to why people resist change. Some people have uh, learning anxieties. So maybe uh, they feel that they've got a lack of competence a lack of experience or knowledge in that particular area and as such that is going to hold them back maybe the change is actually being trying or trying to be implemented um, at a poor time in the organization's uh, calendar we have to understand that a business has a heartbeat and we have to make change fit with that heartbeat there are seasonalities where you know it is inappropriate to run change and of course we have uh, the ultimate and that is uh, the whole minefield of office politics to navigate so there's a list it's not comprehensive it's not extensive but I'm just going to add one last thing here or is it just because it is our habits Humans are, by nature, habitual animals. And when we come to change, uh, we are attacking those habits because our habits uh, keep us safe. They make us effective. I dare say if I asked you, um, uh, although uh, at this point things are very, very different, uh, but on a normal day going into the office, take it back uh, six, seven months, uh, if I asked you what you did between uh, your feet hitting the bedroom floor and your feet getting into your office, you probably wouldn't be able to give me that much detail unless something extraordinary happened on the way to work. Because our habits as to how we get up and how we do our ablutions and travel to work and all those good things take us through without us having to think about it. So we become effective, maybe not efficient, but certainly effective in what we're trying to do. However, habits are the inhibitor and yet the goal is the phrase. And what does that mean? Well, we have a habit and what change is trying to do is break that habit. And yet we're trying to implement another habit which is different in the future. So yes, they are the inhibitor to begin with, and yet they are the goal of the change towards the back end. So breaking habits also causes concern. 
which is absolutely right um, and proper because we like our habits. We enjoy um, this habitual life that we have because it stops us having to worry and think about things. So the, we all go through these concerns, but it was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, who originated the change or transitions curve, having observed the cycle that people went through uh, when they faced bereavement. Management researchers then translated this into uh, change within organizations because the curve is remarkably similar. However, there are some points to note. The first half of the graph is internally focused. This is you looking at stuff from your perspective and internally uh, trying to understand what's going on. Whereas the second half of the graph uh, is externally focused. And this is something uh, where we're looking into the organization and beyond. Sometimes you may have gone down the curve and up the other side. So you're, you know, you've got through it, you think, only uh, to be pushed back again by some event associated with the change. And often uh, our managers will have gone through the curve and be going up the other side. And for some reason, they can't understand why everyone else isn't as optimistic as they are. And there's a really, really simple reason for that. Because other people are still going down the slope. And while they're going down the slope and on the left hand side, you're internally focused. And it's difficult to hear any communication from those who are going up the right hand side of this slope. So there's an idea as to you know, why things don't get translated or communicated or understood uh, terribly well in some basic form. But let's, uh, let's now just have a look at some of these elements. Shock, numbness, denial. This is sort of characterized by a sense of disbelief, if you like. Uh, non-acceptance of the change. Maybe you're trying to prove to yourself that it isn't really happening uh, and hoping that, you know, if you keep your head down, it'll all go away. Uh, it almost sort of equates to fake news, as, uh, as we would call it nowadays. So something like um, a, the change, you suddenly announce it, there's an awareness that it's there, uh, then the numbness comes and you think, yeah, no, really, that's not right. Uh, and you're into denial. They can't do without our department. They can't do without the way we do things here. You know, the, the traditional way is the right way and all of that sort of stuff. And then we get into the next bit, the blame, the anger, which is where we experience anger and frustration. But really, we're slightly unaware of us being angry and frustrated. Because what we do is we sort of take no responsibility for our emotions. We blame others. And ultimately, when you recognize the situation, you start to blame yourself as well. It's them over there. They're the ones who haven't been doing this right all these years. That's why we're having to go undergo this change. And then the dawn starts to break and you think, well, maybe, possibly I've had something to do with that. So we're starting to start this internalization of why things aren't right. And once we suddenly realize that things aren't right, and maybe it's something to do with us as well, then the panic, the dread and the depression start to set in. And this is where we're attempting to avoid the inevitable. And we're hitting those lows and we're responding with apathy or sadness or uh, even being unresponsive uh, in its entirety. I'm just not going to participate. So the panic and dread drives a particular type of behavior. And one thing that leaders can't do is allow people to wallow in their panic and dread because that is 
very, very bad for the human soul. So uh, what we do is we try and get them through that. And I'll talk about that uh, in, in a moment. To the point where we have acknowledged that the situation is the situation. And we are moving forwards. And maybe I'm just behind the rest of everybody else because I've been a bit intransigent. Uh, I've been a bit of a stick in the mud. And I now need to accept that this is the situation. And with acceptance actually comes um, almost a freedom. Once you've accepted the situation, now there's only one way to go. And I'm going to try and carve this out in my own way, if I possibly can. Which means that you get into the experimentation, the renewed hope, the discovery side of things. So we've been very inward looking. And now the idea arrives that perhaps there are things out there. Perhaps some of these changes might actually be worth at least thinking about. Perhaps I might just ask to see the job description of that new role that I've been uh, presented with. So we're starting to sort of move forwards and maybe there's some training available to you and some some coaching available to you which there wasn't in the past you didn't need it in the past and now of course you're getting it and you're thinking well I, I didn't have training for about five years leading up to this and now I've got some training so maybe this isn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be and you hopefully end up with the sort of satisfaction and integration piece. And as you enter this new world that's changed, there may be the discovery that things aren't as bad as you imagined. Perhaps the company was telling the truth when it said there would be new opportunities and maybe a better way of working. And that's really what uh, humans tend to go through when we are faced with uh, a transition underneath a change. So how can leaders help? Well, you have to be aware that people get stuck in this curve and recognize they may need specific assistance to get through. Just shouting at somebody or using a bit of a stick to beat them through this is not going to help. Uh, it will cause them to retreat uh, and become more intransigent and uh, it is not good for the way that they are going to approach the change and approach the future. So uh, people do get stuck and not only do they get stuck but the length and depth of the curve is not a fixed length. It's not a fixed depth. It's different for everyone. So the length and depth relate to an individual. You may see people rush through the sudden shock, numbness, denial, um, straight through panic into acceptance because they've seen what this is act actually going to do. They have seen that future and they understand the vision that's been placed in front of them and they're on their way up the, the upside of the curve. So not only have they shortened the timeline, but they've also most probably uh, reduce the depth of it. And then you may see other people who are still sitting there in denial while everybody else is moving through down onto into acceptance. So, you know, people do get stuck and it's all down to personality um, and your beliefs and all sorts of other things. So they are major factors. The curve is a function of time. The whole transition is a function of time. Some people need longer to absorb change than others. This isn't about going through the various emotions. This is about being able to absorb and take on the change itself. So that curve may lengthen because of coaching and, uh, and training and things like that and trying to absorb what we need to absorb. But be aware as a leader, that there are some positive things as well as negative things that come out of this curve. The positive aspects, maybe people will um, come up with new ideas. 
better ideas than we have already got. So what you need to do is accentuate those positives at the right time to engage with the, uh, the population and move them forwards. It also helps uh, with the fact that you, have, you are now listening to people and taking notice of what they're saying. And therefore, others are now going to be saying, well, actually, uh, they are listening to us. So maybe this change won't be as bad as the last one we suffered. And finally, one thing I'd like to do before I lead you into uh, William Bridges transition work, um, we can ascribe sort of three areas to the curve, if you like. And William Bridges talked about ending losing and letting go and we can map that onto Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, curve as sort of taking you to the point of sort of panic and dread maybe into a little bit of depression in there. He then said there's a neutral zone which uh, takes you through to um, yeah I'm a bit insecure here through to testing and experimentation and then there is a new beginning the new world, if you like. Um, and that's the sort of last chunk. So if we look at William Bridges, one thing that he talks about is transition rather than change. Changes are external to us individuals and often beyond our control. Their situations, their events, their plans, their actions and activities Whereas transitions, on the other hand, are internal and within our own control. And they're all about how we react to changes. So if we look at his three big chunks, the first one, ending, losing and letting go, you will notice there are some big similarities with that change curve from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. The fact that we talk about the fear and the denial, the uncertainty, the sense of loss and disorientation and that sort of thing. And this is where uh, leaders need to do as much communication uh, as they possibly can to ensure that, yes, I know we're losing stuff. I know we're letting go of things, but there is a positive out of the other end of it. So we have to sort of uh, engineer our words very carefully so that people don't retreat into their shells and, uh, and get uh, very, very confused um, and then back off the change and actually internalize the transition for themselves. Moving forwards, crossing the bridge, which is quite apt for William Bridges, um, he comes up with his neutral zone. And in here, very similar to the middle of the Kubler-Ross curve, um, <clears throat> we may get some resentment towards the change because I've had to get off my old habit as it were and I've now got to do something else. There's probably lower morale and lower productivity because people are talking to one another, um, they're discussing the change, they're discussing what's right, what's wrong about it, why we couldn't have left it as it was and all the other good stuff that goes on. There will be some who are anxious about their role and their status, their identity, particularly with status if managers are being uh, moved into a, a different role with a different sized department and things like that um, and their, therefore their status and identity is quite important to them. And there will be, always be a little bit of scepticism about what on earth is going on anyway. But during this time this is the time when leaders need to get in amongst everybody. And it's not so much dealing with the ending, losing and letting go and supporting people there. This is more about getting in and cultivating an environment where you want people to be more creative. You want them to innovate. You want them to think about what is coming and can they do something about it? Because if they're doing that, they are now participating in their destiny which means that they have an input to the future and therefore uh, will be more um, willing to accept the future on their terms. 
the new beginning is all about taking that energy that you've managed to create during the, the back end of the neutral zone because it won't happen at the, at the front end and then driving onwards taking it to a slightly higher energy level making sure that people are open to learning providing them with the training providing them with the coaching and then making sure that the renewed commitment to the group or their role is there and supported by uh, the management. So, what uh, can leaders do to help people move through the curve? And I think the, the, the first thing is all about preparation. It's all about what are the signals we should be picking up? Because way back in uh, at the beginning, people will have feelings, questions, concerns, unease, anxiety, fears, and all sorts of other stuff about this, uh, about this change. We should not dismiss those. Some of those concerns may be absolutely valid and we have not necessarily validated the end point properly. And therefore, we should listen to their concerns. Some of them are going to be personal concerns. Some of them are concerns which don't exist. And therefore, we need to sort those out and we need to have those conversations um, in an appropriate way. The other thing is, you've got the signals, but what can you actually see going on? Is something subversive happening? Is the, uh, is the entire office jubilant because we're actually moving into a digital future uh, away from uh, paper and paper clips and staples and things like that? Uh, you know what is what can you actually see going on because you can build on that what's being said what have you heard either overtly or covertly or more to the point what is not being said because what is not being said is probably of more importance to be quite honest so listen to what's going on and then think about well how am i going to deal with this and craft some sort of uh, supportive response uh, to all those questions and all those concerns. So as you move through that curve, as you move through the transition with William Bridges and you get into the ending, losing and letting go, I think it's always great if you can just sit there as a leader and say, you know, uh, I just got to remind everyone that transition is normal. There's nothing else we can do. We're all going to feel peculiar and we're all going to feel that uh, things are going to change and possibly not for the better uh, for some people as they might, might imagine it. Uh, but okay, let's just get through it. Don't avoid it though, because transition is transition. People will want to talk about how they feel. And I think that's a useful thing for them to do and let them do so. Let them talk to others in the office. They will anyway, uh, but have an open door and an open ear. Uh, don't be judgmental, I think is, uh, is key for this one. Allow people to say what they, what, what they uh, need to say and how they want to express their feelings. You need to encourage people to talk with their peers. Um, not necessarily with experts, because experts will come up with uh, the transition model and all the other good stuff that they know about. But have a chat with other people, maybe people who've been through this already. Get the frustrations out into the open. So we need to be empathetic with this one. We don't want to necessarily come up with a solution for this. You just need to listen. Think about uh, how you're going to support everybody, including yourself as a leader, by the way, uh, because the whole situation is going to be stressful. So think about what are the strategies out there for reducing stress and then recommend certain strategies to people. One thing I tend to do is uh, work with facts rather than emotion. Um, emotion is uh, 
it's, it's very time absorbing and um, a stressful in itself. So if we look at facts, then um, I think taking emotion off the table is a good thing to do. Humans react with emotion, but they understand facts. And although they may not like the facts, the facts are going to be the facts. So then they can start to base their own views and opinions of the future on those facts. Uh, and then uh, suggest that people get physical during uh, our lockdown. Uh, it's all been about, you know, make sure you take your hours worth of walk. Um, and absolutely get physical. That does not mean fighting, by the way. Uh, but what it does mean is getting some exercise in. Our gyms and uh, swimming pools are shut. So we have to do something different. But get exercise in because it does help. What about the neutral zone? That area where uh, things are now sort of starting to change over. So uh, whilst in the neutral zone, leaders need to promote discussion with positive objective members of the team. So we got people who are now on board and they're going, oh yeah, I can see this. I understand why we're doing this. Now let's have a discussion. Maybe bringing in some of those who aren't quite so positive into that discussion so that we can broaden that discussion across the party and hopefully gain more acceptance of what the change is actually going to do and how we're going to get through it. Allow people time to recover from the shock they've had of this transition and the understanding of that change because uh, we will at this point need to provide a bit of perspective for them. Make sure that uh, people do participate, they do innovate, they do become part of the future and not part of the, of the past and therefore a bit of a problem. So uh, keep encouraging that. And finally, if you are going to give people training and coaching, would you please make sure there is sufficient training and sufficient coaching available to help embed that change? And what about our new beginning? A plan. Humans do quite like a plan. We've heard it quite frequently during lockdown where the prime minister has said, we're going to do this, and the uh, leader of the opposition has jumped in and said, where's the detail? And uh, I watch this with amusement because I think, well, I think they're just setting out a plan right now. Of That's where I think they're going. And uh, we haven't got the detail quite yet. So, you know, the whole point about letting people know what we're going to try and do. And then make that visible. We can set some targets, some small steps initially. Small steps are really important. If you try and take giant leaps, then uh, people will fall by the wayside. They'll go, oh, that's, uh, I, there's no way we can achieve that within the next month. No, fairly obviously for most people, there isn't. Uh, so smaller steps, make it sensible. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, keep encouraging people uh, to uh, find those coaches, find the supporters and make them available to anybody else. Positive challenge. I agree with positive challenge. I agree that we do not always know best. We have thought about something, we have an idea of how we're going to get there, or we have an idea of how this is going to work in the future, but we don't know. What about somebody coming up with a bright idea? Don't knock it, accept it and encourage it. Again, it's making sure that people have a chip in the game in the future. Um, and everybody wants to know where we are. Uh, even in project management terms, you know, your project board is going to ask you about the progress of your project. Change is no different. We need to review where we are and discuss it openly with those who are coming on that journey with us.
empathy, incentive and reward are always more preferable to using punishment when it comes to encouraging people through transition. Uh, Skinner and Thorndike found that it, you know, they had success in reward and punishment systems when they applied them to animals. However, humans are not the same as other animals on this planet. And systems like those proposed uh, by Hertzberg and Pink are more reliable and have more success. So let's have a quick look. Frederick Hertzberg, he famously researched job satisfaction as a component of human motivation. During this, he and his team interviewed hundreds of people, asking them to describe critical incidents that had led them to feel good about their work, and therefore what would be a motivator during a change program. The results of these interviews produced a list of factors that lead to positive job satisfaction, such as those shown on the left in yellow. However, the research team also asked the reverse question. What had led people to feel less satisfied with their jobs? The results of these inquiries are listed on the right in green. And what Hertzberg and his colleagues noticed was that these dissatisfiers were different in kind from the satisfiers. Dissatisfiers were all about the content of the job, extrinsic. Whilst the satisfiers were, in various ways, built into the job itself, so they're intrinsic. He also noted that beyond a certain level, the dissatisfiers could no more create positive motivation than good drains could create positive health. If in poor condition, they lead to poor outcomes, but in themselves, they do not create good ones. Satisfiers, on the other hand, were directly associated with job satisfaction and increased motivation to work. If we look at Daniel Pink, he confirmed Hertzberg's general findings and he cites some MIT research uh, showing that for tasks requiring even a modest amount of cognitive skill, increases in financial reward are not related to increased performance. And you'll find a number of YouTube videos with Daniel Pink speaking on them um and uh also ted talks uh he is well worth a watch should you wish to um in fact what he comes up with is maybe the reverse might be true so this implies that organizations need to pay people sufficiently so that pay is no longer an issue in hertzberg's terms not a dissatisfier but beyond that financial reward may have limited value. So what uh, Dan Pink suggests is that there are three factors um, or motivators, and they are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And when we look at autonomy, he says, and quite rightly in my opinion, that people like to be self-directed, high degree of freedom, then they can make decisions on the direction and the methods and circumstances of their work. When he comes to mastery, he recognizes that people like to do things well. And if you're gonna do something well, you tend to want to get better at doing it. And if they want to get better at doing something, they probably do things that they value so they get better at it. So giving people opportunities to grow and develop and excel at their work is motivating for them. And then finally, purpose. Uh, I don't know anybody that I've ever worked with or even in family life um, who don't feel that their work matters unless it has meaning and value. 
And therefore, you choose to invest in uh, your time and your energy and your emotion in those activities that they consider worthwhile. So what he's saying is that give people a bit of autonomy, make them feel that they can become masters in all of this, and give them a purpose for doing it. Make it worthwhile. What is it that we're trying to achieve? So they look at it and go, yeah, I'm adding to this. I'm, put, I'm adding value to my organization or to my role or, or to my colleagues' roles. Uh, and, and therefore, yeah, I can, I can sign up to that. That's cool. And then uh, finally, um, these three key motivators will end up at the heart of any change initiative in, as far as engagement and a willingness to direct discretionary effort in the right direction. So, in conclusion, during change, leaders need to observe six key things. Do share what you know. Um, at any particular time that you know it, don't hide anything. The minute you hide stuff and you're found hiding it, people will start to disbelieve what you're telling them. Your credibility is at stake here. Don't forget to make time for those questions. People are curious. They want to know. Unless they bury their head in the sand, in which case uh, the ostrich position is never a great place to be. Because when the problems arise, there's only one part of their anatomy left to get kicked. Do please outline the change plan. Give them a roadmap, even if it's at high level to begin with, and then fill in the detail as you go through so that people can hang on to these activities and actions and say, yeah, I understand why we're doing this in this particular way. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't tackle everything at once. Major changes have failed miserably by everybody trying to do everything at once. It's, a, it's, it's an, uh, an organizational problem with a lot of, uh, of businesses and uh, sectors because we want the thing done quickly. Uh, reward rather than punish, always. That is, a, 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 you know, the, the encouragement is what you're looking for here. And um, always, always walk the talk. If you are asking people to change their behaviours and their attitudes, you have to do the same sort of thing. You cannot be a target because the minute you're a target, somebody will find a bow and arrow. Let me just end by applying William Bridges' model to our COVID-19 crisis. We've now been through the shock and fear of the outbreak and we've left the ending, losing and letting go period. And I think most of us are now in the neutral zone. We understand there are changes and the novelty of the situation has started to wear off. We're looking ahead and asking questions. But while there may be a tendency to rush straight through to the new beginnings, the neutral zone actually poses an opportunity for innovation and thinking anew about how we work and live. For leaders today, we should use this neutral zone as a time to reflect, explore, be curious about our prior ways of doing things. Are there opportunities to improve, innovate, maybe to adjust? It's no coincidence that some of the most cutting edge companies have birthed new creations through chaos in their transition to a new normal. Look at the Formula One teams who have worked with the hospitals to provide new kit. So if you're working with change teams, embrace the neutral zone as a field of opportunity to explore new options. Searching for new opportunities may not mean a complete restructuring of your business. It may be as simple as small changes to drive customer value or boost efficiency, or even resolving to do more of what you love. If anything is certain with COVID-19, it's uncertainty. Let's not accelerate too quickly toward our new beginnings. We may miss a golden opportunity to bring something really amazing into the world or into our organization, into our teams, 
or even into our families. Let me give you a very simple little example. The Loose Cannon Brewery in Abingdon-on-Thames, where I live, started local deliveries during lockdown. It has been so successful that customers have asked for it to continue. They've now bought a new electric van and have added a new distribution channel to their business. Well done. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little uh, session and um, I'd love to see some of you at our course when eventually we manage to get back face to face or possibly even doing it virtually. Uh, and at this point, I will now uh, stop sharing my screen and I will hand you back uh, to Kate. Thanks very much, Richard. That was um, really very interesting and uh, a really good uh, recap of uh, some of the fundamentals of, of change management. Um, thank you. Um, we've got a, a question come in, um, but uh, uh, I also invite people to post further questions through the Q&A um, uh, facility. Um, so, uh, Richard, if you're happy to take some questions now. Um, can you please share some examples of how you can engage people in mutual shaping of the ch of, of change, i.e. sort of co-design? Um, is, is that clear, Richard? Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, getting workshops together is always a good thing. Uh, make them fun. Uh, don't, uh, don't try and force anything out of them, but get people's opinions. Uh, I think the big thing with a workshop like this is getting people to understand that you're listening to them rather than this is a workshop where I'm going to tell you what you're going to do because that isn't what the workshop is intended to, uh, for. Uh, the, that workshop should bring out loads of great ideas, get them onto flip charts and then get people to think about what's been put there. Are those realistic things? Can we achieve those things? Can we achieve them in the time scale? Uh, and all of that sort of stuff, because then people will feel invested in that change. So get people in a room, get them talking. You will have naysayers and you will have those who are uh, considered to be blockers, um, in which case you need to have a discussion with them either before or after the workshop, depending on when you have noticed that they are becoming a blocker, um, uh, to, uh, to ask them to participate in a, in a more sensible way, if you like. Uh, but Generally speaking, get people in a room. They'll want to talk about this stuff. They'll want to present their ideas. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, oh, we've got another question come in. So um, can a team get more buy-in if they all complete a change management course? Good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a client where uh, the whole team that was un going to undergo the change uh, came to, uh, basically it was a two day workshop um, and I, I think they held three of them, uh, reasonably about 30 people, something like that. And once they would sort of understood the basics of change and why things, you know, change in the individual is one thing, Change in the organization is something different and how you practice change is something else. So those three elements need to be put together. And once people start to understand what those elements are all about, why people feel like they do, why an organization has to change in a particular way because it is a type of organization and what are some of the practicalities of doing change? Uh, I think the answer to your question is yes, it can be incredibly helpful to have the group together. Um, would I put them all out onto some form of open change management certified course? Probably not, to be quite honest with you. Um, that's fine for people who are going to become change managers, change agents, business change managers and the like. So they get a, a much more in-depth feel to it. But I think, uh, I think it's, it's very useful to get the teams together and when you do that if you've got more than one group to get together uh, try and work out how you're going to get the best out of each group and it doesn't mean putting all the positive people in one and the negative people in another you may need to mix them up great thank you Richard 
Um, we've got some more questions coming in, but um, I'm afraid we've only got time for one more. Um, so Richard, uh, do you have any thoughts about pros and cons of stratified workshops, um, particularly to address EIA concerns of change? Wow. Uh, stratified workshops. That's an interesting one. Um, I don't really have that much thought on that. Um, and not because I haven't thought about it, uh, but generally speaking, working in change, uh, I, I, tend to, uh, I tend to adopt a fairly sort of generalistic approach to begin with. And if I therefore need to then focus on specifics, then uh, we'll, pr we'll put a workshop together for something very specific. Uh, but um, certainly uh, doing, uh, doing change at a very high level within the organisation, um, I will talk in very general terms. Getting down to the lower levels, I will then uh, get into some more detail with that. But other than that, uh, no, I think change is change. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to end it there today. Um, but thank you everyone for attending and for joining us. And, and thank you very much, Richard, for a most interesting session. We've had some great feedback as well about the session. So thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, if anyone has any further questions, um, then feel free to get in touch with us at the CPD unit. Um, but otherwise, we're going to sign off for today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.